Today we continue in our study, a uh, survey of the Old Testament. And today we're looking at the journey of Israel to the Promised Land, the first part of their journey, at least from Egypt to Sinai. And we want to look at that journey. But before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you for the preciousness of this thing that we call life. And we know we are here for a reason. We are here because there are things that you have left us to do in the world. And just as you did not immediately take Israel up from Egypt to the promised land, tried to teach them some things on their way and prepare them for that event of entering in. So you have some things you want us to do before we go to your presence forever and ever. Marvelous are all thy works and thy duties and thy purposes and your provision for our lives. And we say that you do all things and we praise you for that. May we learn from the uh, study and the view of Israel in the Old Testament. So, teach us today. We ask. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask you to say, Amen. 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 Now, today is the day after Labor Day. And of course, this year, as always, traditionally, it is. Though it is not perhaps the last good day to do it or the last time, it is the last scheduled time for a weekend trip to go somewhere. One last time in the summer, although the rates are cheaper and the weather sometimes is prettier after the rain today, but it is traditionally the last day of travel before the hardship of winter calendar of events. And a lot of people were traveling this weekend, and especially Friday and then yesterday there were a lot of people on the road going here and there. And of course it affected everything. The gas prices over this weekend went up. Strange, amazing though it is, uh, uh, things are affected like that. And so we've just come to Labor Day. And the moving of people here today. Life is sometimes spoken of as a journey, and so it is. A journey from birth to death. A journey from time to eternity. And I think it's significant here, and I think it's important here to note that God did not take Israel to put this way to the promised land. They could have just went up the main highway from Egypt to uh, Canaan, and they could have been there in a short time. Of course, Pharaoh's army could have also marched up that highway pretty easily, too. So, and God had a different end and a different purpose for them. He, he had the Red Sea. The slaves had, did not have the equipment or the ability or the training to fight against the armies of Pharaoh, the mightiest army in the world. But God used one of his natural sources, along with a little bit of his power, to demonstrate and to destroy the armies of Egypt. But God could have marched them straight up, and, and uh, but he took them a long way away. And part of the reason he did that was he wanted to teach them some things. Remember, this is not a people fresh from the Bible college of God's instruction. These are people who have been slaves in Egypt for centuries now, and they have, they have gotten away from the traditions of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and God wants to redeem that and to set new principles in place for their lives and his dealings with them. And so time is required for that. So it is with the Christian life. We, are, we could go to heaven the moment we are saved. We are ready for heaven, but God knows that we're not quite ready yet because we'd be there if we were. He has left us here for several reasons. 
to do His work, to be His witness, to learn to live by faith, to learn the principles, if you will, and instructions, to have the experience of maturity that Israel needed through the wilderness before they got to the promised land. And so we need things to do. We see, of course, that the journey began with the Lamb. It began at redemption, and we talked about that last time. Uh, then as they went out of Egypt, as they journeyed, uh, God gave them the principle of the firstborn. And remember, that was the very thing that the blood of the Lamb helped them to escape the requirement of God for the life of the firstborn in Egypt. And remember, he had adopted Israel as his children. He had chosen them as his family of the earth. And, and the instituting of the firstborn being specially unto the Lord, both animals and human beings, of course, is a, a reminder and a, a symbol of that, that position and that choice and that adoption that Christ made towards his earthly people, Israel. And so today, the the viewpoint is we've started with these things and we've seen how they are pictures to the Christian life. And we've seen how that, that God is going to teach His people Israel lessons in the wilderness. Our thought today is that we need to learn from our journey. Most of us are just caught up with the events of it. We go somewhere new, we see a new sight, we look at new things, our eyes are and minds are filled with the information around us. There's a lot of places on this earth I'd like to better. Travel is such an interesting and, and helpful thing from this thing of learning. It's one way that men learn, to go to different places and see different cultures and learn of different histories and see it visually so that it's etched upon their brain in a way that you cannot get from a book. And so travel is a beneficial thing. Well, we say today that we must learn from our journey in our Christian life. There's some lessons to be learned. And if we're to learn those lessons, we need to see and learn from Israel's journey in their life. And after the Passover and the leaving of Egypt and the instituting of the unleavened bread and the information about the firstborn, they came up to a place called Egypt. And here God revealed Himself to them through this marvelous thing of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And from that point on, of course, they were led and directed by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And it was perhaps one pillar, not two. It depended on which side you were looking at. From the Israelite side, it was always, I think, a pillar of fire where you could see and know this glowing cloud in the sky was God's presence. And from the other side, it was a, a, a pillar of cloud and darkness so that the enemy could not see into what Israel was doing directly. But anyway, whatever this was, it represents, of course, the ministry of person of the Holy Spirit that comes into the believer's life right after salvation. And of course, the very first thing that we would know and observe and think about, if we're to be led, if we're to be directed, if we're to learn anything in our Christian life, we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit to do that, of course, and that's why God has given him to the believer in the Christian life. We must be led. If we're not led, we're not going to learn anything. If we're led, how can we know where God wants us to go and what He wants us to do? And so Israel did not move until the cloud moved and the fire moved until the cloud moved. And so they were led. And we must be led. And of course, then they come up to the Red Sea. And you know that wonderful story, and, and, and perhaps you have seen the, the uh, recent cartoon made, Prince of Egypt, as I have. And what a, a fascinating, what a mental picture of the exodus of the people of Israel uh, that is. And even though its emphasis is 
not totally spiritual, it's more entertainment than, than the emphasis that we would have. There are, of, of course, it is somewhat true to the, the, the situations, and, and it is a wonderful, dramatic presentation of these events and how they came up. They were trapped. Pharaoh was coming with his army. They were up against the Red Sea. Where would they go? Why had God put them into such a place? And yet God had made a way when there was no way. And by making that way, they were rescued and their enemies were destroyed. And of course, the, the passing through the water in the Red Sea reminds us of baptism. It is a, there are perhaps more than one lesson to be learned at the Red Sea, but of course it is a picture of baptism. After redemption has taken place, and as we begin the first initial part of the journey, we have received the leadership and ministry of the Holy Spirit upon salvation, then, then we need to identify with the program and plan of God in, in the particular age in which we in. And of course that's the church age, and just as they were they remembered this event of passing through the Red Sea and it was an identification that they were the people of God journeying to the promised land that God had given to them. And this was an identification of the focus of God. And so is uh, part of baptism today. It is an identification with God's program in the church. That's why we are when we uh, when we join a local church, that's the time to be, uh, we must be baptized. Those Baptist boys do, of course, but we need to be scripturally immersed in water as an indication that we've been saved and that we're starting this good of our Christian life. That we're identifying with God's person and place and what he's doing. And so we have this picture of this of the Red Sea and of course one of his main lessons is this picture of baptism. They journeyed a little while further and they came to the bitter waters of Merah. Now they sang a new song after they got through the Red Sea and they rejoiced in their deliverance and, and their new life and their journey. But the place that they were journeying was a hot air, air, uh, arid region, the desert, and they were too thirsty. And so the time they got to Mara, they needed water for him. They were thirsty, tired, and weary, and worn. And of course, uh, they started with the joy of their journey, as thus they should have, but soon they began to be weary with the work of it, and the toil of it, and the circumstances of it. And so the waters of Mara, and they, they rushed up to the water and drank it, it was so bitter. They needed it for life, but it was so bitter, it was awful taste. And remember, of course, God's instructions about it, just as it is true, of the water to the man. Cut it down, cast it into the water, and they became it. And of course, here is a picture of the suffering of the Christian life. And, and we want to use the word suffer, which, of course, Peter does when he speaks about suffering in the epistles of Peter. And Paul uses the phrase in a little different way, enduring hardness. And he talks about suffering too, but he talks about enduring hardness, that the journey and the lot of a Christian as a soldier is to endure hardness. And I know that there are times when we're called to do both of those things, and they're really the, the the, uh, aspects of the same thing. We're told to labor, and that word labor uh, sometimes refers to working until we are fatigued to the very point of fainting, to, to work and labor. And the Christian life is labor and it's work and it's discipline and it's problems and it's struggles against the philosophy and the environment and the conditions in, of this world. We're going upstream, friends. We're not floating down the, the world's river on an inner key, resting. We're going against the current of the world. We're in the enemy's territory. And, and the Christian life has suffering in it. But isn't it possible that the cross of Christ in the person of Jesus takes the suffering experience? Oh, it's, uh, 
that though some of our life is so busy that we have hardly any years, that when the cross, when the truth is put into the world, it's the place. How far is that? How what? And so we see the picture of the hardships and the journeys and the sufferings and the years and the trials and the labors and the works of the Christian life. And for those labors and works, and God knows our praise that He has done us, He has provided the seeds to make you the most bitter, wonderful experience. Friend, that's why we put sugar in heaven. You know, you can take the most tart and, and tangy of substance and, and put the sugar of God's provision in the Lord Jesus Christ. From the waters of Mara, they journeyed to the well uh, oasis of Eden. And here, of course, is a refreshing time of the Christian life. Here are the, the leaves you leave me beside the quiet, the steel, the tragedy of the water, the peaceful time. When the Lord says, Come apart and pray. When the truth the wonderfulness of the Christian life leaps out from the Word of God. And the assurance and the joy and the blessing and the refreshing takes place. And God gives us times like that and praises made to death. That all is not torn, but falsehoodness and weariness and work and, and labor and discipline and unpleasantness. And, and I know that that the people that say if there were no heaven, the Christian life is still better or wrong because Paul says that if, if the resurrection is not true, we really don't have hope in heaven. We're all being most miserable because we have put all our assurance in that and, and the world is eating and drinking and living for this moment and we are not supposed to be. But I tell you that the Christian life is too wonderful sometimes just in its own aspect either, not even in heaven. And it's, of course, because that our salvation is real here and because we are going to heaven that it is so wonderful, but it is wonderful here. And, and the Bible speaks of the joy of the redeemed being greater than the joy of the unsaved in the time of their blessing when their money piles up and their harvest comes in. Friend, we don't have to wait for our ship to come in. We already have this year. We're in this year. And, and Christ is in us in the Christian life. It is wonderful to be Christian. I don't know how people live any other way. I don't know why they would want to. We have so much better than that. And God has blessed us with refreshing and the oasis and even. And so we rested and we were refreshed at this place. We talk about two other things that occur as they journey on towards Sinai. And, of course, we're going to stop with Sinai today, and then next time we're going to look at uh, their wanderings as they come up to the Promised Land, and in disobedience they will not go in, and then God causes them to wander around in circles in the wilderness for 40 years, and then He brings them back up into the land in victory. But... Uh, there are two other things that were given here. God gave them provision for food. And we, we talked about the lamb and its benefits of food and how that spiritually uh, parallels the, the message of Christ and salvation, how that spiritually we are to appropriate his person as we would eat food. Well, they needed food in the wilderness, friend, and they were in the wilderness and there were millions of people. And, and how could they be fed? They could not go out and obtain the food by their own efforts. There was not enough there to sustain their lives. How could they be fed? And notice, write it on the wall, put it on your mind, print it everywhere you go, and you must need to remember that the benefits and God's work in the Christian life are never it cannot be. We cannot find that spiritual food that we need. We cannot produce it in our own labor, in our own work. 
fire our own methods, God must give us stuff. And so he gave them that. It's wonderful. Uh, my professor said it tastes like vanilla wafers and peanut butter all the time. He, he must have liked that. Uh, but uh, I, I guess if they've been like me, he liked anything that was good. Whatever it tastes like, friend, the man was a wonderful place to eat. And they were giving it every day. Now, in the flesh, they got tired of the manna. And when you look in the flesh, you don't appreciate the cross. But they, they should have loved that manna. In fact, in the New Testament, that's what the Israelites said to Christ. When you the Messiah, give us physical bread like you just did in the miracle of the Jesus of the Lord, just feed us all the time. That's what we do. That's what God did to us in the world. And so we have this picture and this example, this type, the bread of life, of course, is clearly documented in the New Testament. He was the bread of life. He said, I am the bread. God gave you the Father, the man in the wilderness, I am the bread. And so we see the man again. And then we see, not only food, we see water. And came up to almost the Sinai. And this is the event upon which our great heel prophet would rock the baby Jesus. They came up to the rocks of horror, mountains there. And they were thirsty, weary, ready to perish for lack of water. Now this striking of the rock here is different from the event in which Moses sealed. Later on it is a similar event and if you compare the two passages you will see that they are different in time and location and chronology. But here Moses struck the rock at God's instruction and water came out and blessed and benefited the people. And seemingly was almost a river that followed them on part of their journey and provided water and sustenance. And you, we know that in the New Testament, Paul tells us that that rock was Christ. Through his person and his life. And of course, uh, I think it refers to Christ and probably through the salvation that we have in Christ, a, a, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us, of course, we only the day when they memorialized this event in Israel in that seven day feast when they poured water out as a symbol of this. Remember that Christ used this occasion to talk about salvation and how that in those that believed in him would be springing up a, a living river of water that would ever flow. And of course this uh, also has implications to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and God's life of Christ within us. And remember, friend, and do not ever forget it, though the Bible very clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, it just as clearly teaches that the other two persons of the Trinity indwell us too. And if you do not know and understand that spiritually Jesus is in your heart, you have no way of effectively living the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is there. Thank our Heavenly Father that He is there. But his ministry is to lift up the person of Jesus and glorify him in our lives. And it is the very character of God, which is Father, Son, and Spirit, that is clearly amplified and example and formed in our lives through the person of Jesus Christ. So that law that provided the other thing necessary to life food and water and of course air is the other necessary ingredient but that, that water that followed him was Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and lifting him up. And then they came up to Sinai and they said Lord just tell us what you want us to do we do it. And we have seen the purposes of the law in the past but there is a there is a necessary application as we've seen as Paul said that laws are for the lawless, those that disobey the law. And we need structures and principles, and after all, the law is a reflection of God's holiness. And so if we're going to learn from our journey in life, we need principles and instruction of right and wrong. And we find those in the law. Of course, the lesson of the law is that we cannot keep those. 
Jewish state. And you know, I think that's an important lesson in Christian life. Just as important as doing the right thing is when we don't do the right thing, realizing the provision that God has made for us. That He has mercy and grace to forgive us. That He does not deal with us in, in, in strict judgment, but He deals with us in mercy and grace. In fact, the law is to teach us that we cannot do that we cannot do those things that we ought to do and should do and need to do that we need God to do them for us and that we need to live in the new nature and not the old. We desperately need instruction and we need it desperately in 2001. And not only do we need to have structure that it benefit as we keep it and obey it, but we need structure to show us our utter helpless that we might depend and trust on the provision of God. And so we have the law and all its teaching and all of its examples of all of its benefits. And God gave Israel the law that, that might channel them into believing in the Messiah. But they perverted it and so it became their hope instead of their road. And instead of believing in Jesus, it was one of the very factors that determined their refusal of him because they thought that they were in a right relationship with God because of who they were in the religion they did. And they missed the Messiah. And they missed personal salvation. And we will miss it too if we think that any of our doing will ever marry any kind of acceptance in the eyes of God. It will not. And so we have these pictures as they journey one after another. And how beneficial. If we're to learn, we must be led. If we're to learn, we must know the, the sweetness of Christ and the bitterness of life. If we are to learn from our journey, we must take advantage of those times and provisions of God to refresh and teach and rest and bless if we are to learn, we must appropriate the bread of life and the water of life and hear the instructions of God's hope of God's hope. We must learn. It's not just a party. It's not just a sightseeing trip. It's not just a walk in the park. This thing that we call life. God has left us here that we might learn some things that we're going to be we're going to be tested. We're going to be evaluated. And so today I say, see the lessons of the journey of the life of Christ.